Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father, from the Savior who lived for us and died for us too, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. There are two different passages from the Bible upon which the sermon will be based today. The first is from Matthew 4, verse 17, which reads, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And the second text comes from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 22. Avoid every kind of evil. Thus declares God's word. Ivan the Great was the czar of all of Russia during the 15th century. He brought together uh, the warring tribes into one vast, powerful empire. Now, as a fighting man, he was courageous. As a general, he was brilliant. However, Ivan was so busy waging his military campaigns that he did not have a family. Now, that bothered his friends and advisors. They reminded him that there was no heir to his throne. And should anything happen to him, the union would be thrown into chaos. You must find yourself a wife who will bear you a son, they told him. And this busy man would reply that he did not have time to go and search for a bride, but if they would find him a suitable one, he would marry her. Well, his advisor searched the capitals of Europe to find an appropriate wife for the great czar. And find her they did. They reported to Ivan of the beautiful, dark-eyed daughter of the king of Greece. She was young, brilliant, and charming. Ivan agreed to marry her sight unseen. And the king of Greece was delighted. It would align Greece in a favorable way with this emerging giant of the north. But he had one condition. He cannot marry my daughter unless he becomes a member of the Greek Orthodox Church. To which Ivan responded, I'll do it. So a priest was immediately dispatched to Moscow to instruct Ivan in the Orthodox faith. Ivan was a quick student and learned the catechism in record time. Arrangements were concluded and the Tsar made his way to Athens, accompanied by 500 of his best troops. He was to be baptized into the faith by immersion. His soldiers, ever loyal, asked to be baptized with him. The patriarch of the church assigned 500 priests to give those soldiers a one-on-one -on -one catechism crash course. And the soldiers, all 500 of them, were to be immersed in one mass baptism. Now crowds gathered from all over Greece. What a sight that must have been. 500 priests and 500 soldiers, 1,000 people walking into the blue waters of the Mediterranean Sea. The priests were dressed in black robes and tall black hats, the official dress of the priests of the Orthodox Church. The soldiers wore their battle uniforms with all their regalia, their ribbons of valor and medals of courage and their weapons of battle. But suddenly a problem developed. For the Orthodox Church prohibited professional soldiers from being members of that church. They would have to give up their commitment to bloodshed. They could not be both killers and members of the Orthodox Church, too. After a hasty round of diplomacy, the problem was quickly solved. As the words were spoken in the baptismal ceremony, and then the priest began to baptize them, each soldier reached to his side and withdrew his sword. Lifting it high overhead, every soldier was totally immersed Everything was immersed except one fighting arm and his sword. They each had one unbaptized arm. They each had one arm that would not be submitted to their new faith. Just like so many people today. What is the one part of your life that you refuse to submit to your faith, to your Savior, Jesus. You know, most of us are perfectly content to keep one or more parts of our life totally separate from our Christian faith. Most of us are more than willing to keep one part of our life away from the control of Jesus Christ, the Savior. What am I talking about? 
Well, I'm talking about all the things we do that we know in the back of our minds go against God's word, and yet we still do them anyway. So what if God calls them a sin? For example, how many of you choose regularly not to come to church on a Sunday morning, even though you know the third commandment means that we're to gather for worship each Sunday? And I'm not talking about when you simply can't come to worship because of health or because of your job. I'm talking about all those times you could come and yet choose not to. Are your Sunday mornings a part of your life that you will not submit to God? Or maybe it's your business practices. Maybe you're perfectly willing to lie in an expense report or deceive a customer about the quality of the product you are selling. Or maybe you're content to take things home from work without paying for them, to steal from your employer. Maybe you're willing to detach your faith from the things you do at work. Are your business practices a part of your life that you will not give over to God? Or, or maybe it's your tongue that you're not willing to give over to your faith. For example, perhaps you know that telling lies is wrong and yet you still continue to tell lies anyway. Or perhaps you know that gossiping about people behind their back is condemned as a sin in the scripture and yet you continue to gossip about people behind their backs on a regular basis. Or perhaps you continue to let your mouth spew forth obscenities and dirty jokes on a regular basis even though God clearly says that such things are wrong for his people. Are you unwilling to submit your tongue to the waters of your baptism? Or maybe you refuse to give your anger over to God. Maybe you refuse to forgive those who have hurt you in the past or let you down, even though God clearly calls on us to forgive others just as he has forgiven us. Are you unwilling to give people a second chance? Is your anger a part of your life that you simply will not turn over to God? Yes, so often we are totally content to let sin linger in our lives. So often we're perfectly content to continue on with our sin, to keep parts of our life outside of the faith. On a phone-in radio program dealing with alcoholism, a caller said, I pray the good Lord to keep me from driving while drinking. To which the host replied, why don't you ask the Lord to keep you from drinking? Now this man apparently never even considered that option of not drinking. He was perfectly willing to continue getting drunk on a regular basis. He just didn't want to drive while drunk. Is there an area of your life that you have never even seriously considered bringing into accord with God's word. If so, then it is to you that our Lord Jesus speaks the words of our text. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And it is to you that Jesus also says, avoid every kind of evil, avoid every form of evil. So first of all, then, Jesus says to all of us, who so desperately want to hang on to our sinful ways, repent. It's interesting, when Martin Luther posted his famous 95 Theses on the door of the Wittenberg Chapel in 1517, the very first of those 95 statements dealt with the topic of repentance. Luther wrote, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. There in the earliest days of the Reformation, Luther realized something that many Christians today either overlook or simply do not understand for themselves. That the entirety of our Christian life on earth is a life of ongoing repentance. On a daily basis, we are meant to repent of our sin. And that means we don't just allow the sin in our lives to continue going on and on and on. We're not just to continue on in our sinful ways. Jesus calls on us to repent. 
But what does it mean to repent? Well, it means, first of all, recognizing the sin in our lives as a sin. Not excusing it any longer, not justifying it any longer, but recognizing it as a sin and as something evil, something filthy and vulgar because it violates God's holy will. Many years back, the sewer system in front of my house got blocked up. And as a result, raw sewage came into my basement through the basement shower. Now, I must tell you that when I had to clean up that sewage, it totally nauseated me. I mean, it was absolutely disgusting. But the, that's exactly how our sin looks to God. We like to pretend our sin is no big deal. We like to minimize how awful our sin is. But in God's eyes, it's just like raw sewage. Vile, disgusting, nauseating. And the first step of repentance then is to recognize our sin as being something vile and nauseating. You know, so often we love our sin. We don't think of it as anything really all that bad. But when we repent, we begin to see sin, the sin we love, in a totally different light. We begin to see it in the same way that God sees it. Something absolutely disgusting. How can I say that you sharing a little gossip every now and then is as putrid as raw sewage? How can I say that you padding your expense account every little bit is vile and evil? Well, quite honestly, I didn't say that. But God does. God looks at all sin in the exact same light. He doesn't have two sets of standards. There is right and there is wrong. And whenever we go against God's word, that's wrong. And it's evil and it's vile and disgusting and nauseating. So the first step of repentance then is to begin to see our sin the way God does. Our sin is not some minor little bad habit. It's nauseating evil. And the second step of repentance is to turn back to God. To turn back to God with that sin. To turn back to God and admit what we have done. To turn back to God and confess our failure to obey his word. To turn back to God and tell him how we have refused to submit all of our life to his lordship. It's to turn back to God. And to ask him, beg him to forgive us and cleanse us. The second step of repentance is to turn back to God. And as you turn back to God, the good news is he will be there for you. He will be there for you with love in his heart and compassion in his eyes. He'll be there to point you to the cross of his son and remind you that Jesus Christ died on that cross for the forgiveness of all your sins. As you turn back to God, he will be there for you to remind you that Jesus gave up his life on that cross especially and primarily for you so that you could be totally forgiven of all sin against God and still be able to spend eternity with God in the glory of his heaven. So the second step of repentance then is to look back to God for forgiveness and restoration and to know that because of the cross of his son Jesus, God will in fact give us those very things. And the third step of repentance is to resolve to avoid every kind of evil, every form of sin from this time forward. The third step of repentance is to actually begin to change our sinful lives. You know, it's one thing to recognize sin as a sin. It's another thing to feel bad about the sinful things we are done. But we're to do more than that. We're also to begin to change our lives so that more and more they're in accord with God's word and will bring glory to his name. We're to actually change our ways so that we no longer have any part of our life that does not agree with our faith. Why is that so important? I mean, as long as we're forgiven anyway, does it really matter if we actually get rid of the sin in our lives? Well, yes, it matters. It matters for at least three different reasons. First of all, we must change our sinful ways for our own benefit. 
Because sin left unchecked will always take control of our heart and then our life and then will begin to destroy us. I mean, think about it. How does a skid row bum become a skid row bum? It starts with one sin, the sin of getting drunk, and then step by step that sin takes control and it destroys. How does a drug addict become a drug addict? Well, it starts by taking illegal drugs for that first time. And then bit by bit, that sin takes control and it destroys. That's what sin does. It always will seek to control us and then destroy us if we allow it to just keep going on in our lives. So we need to get rid of the sin in our lives for our own benefit. But second, we also need to get rid of the sin in our lives for God. I mean, knowing how much he loves us, enough to even send his son Jesus to die for us on the cross, knowing how much God loves us, we now don't want to do anything that would hurt God or grieve him. And our sin does just that. So we also want to change our sinful ways because of love for God. Plus, we also want to change our sinful ways for the benefit of the world around us. I'll tell you what, when Christians continue on in their sin, it makes it so much harder for non-Christians to ever take our faith seriously. It makes it that much harder for the Spirit to bring unbelievers into our faith. A Catholic priest working in an inner city was once walking down an alley one evening on his way home when a young man came up to him and poked a knife into his back. Give me your money, the young man demanded. The priest opened his jacket and was reaching into an inner pocket to remove his wallet. And as he did so, he exposed his clerical collar. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Father, the young man said. I didn't see your collar. I don't want your money. Trembling from the scare, the priest instinctively reached into his pocket to get out a cigarette. He then offered one to the young man. Here, have one. Oh, no, I can't do that, the young man replied. I gave them up for Lent. Now, I'm sure you can see the hypocrisy of that young man's statement. I mean, here he is, a spiritual person who's giving up smoking for Lent, but he still would try to rob someone. Well, that's just what the world thinks about us. Whenever we just allow a sin to continue on in our lives, it leads non-believers then to doubt in the reality of our faith. So for the sake of the loss too, we must truly get rid of the sin in our lives. My friend, is there a part of your life that you've been keeping outside the lordship of Jesus Christ? Is there something in your life that you know goes against God's word? but you've been perfectly willing to continue on with that sin anyway, then today God says to you, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And today he also says to you to start avoiding every form of evil. And of course, knowing his love for us in Christ Jesus, the love that was displayed at the cross, knowing his love, we now gladly want to do just that. In Christ's name, indeed, amen.